Welcome back to the Dallas Prospect. Today we are talking about the Mavericks 130-104 beatdown in Charlotte, officially clinching a top six seed, which means the playoffs, not the play in. The drama is over. We don't have to worry about that anymore. Dallas wins its 15th game in its last 17 attempts. That is the longest and best, I should say, the best such streak since their championship year. This has been a prolonged period of success. And really, if you look at this, even before the trade deadline, it started trending in the right direction. Trade deadline happened, continued rolling for just a minute, got real bad all of a sudden for about a six to eight game range. And now it's gone right back. So really, if you take out that one period of about a week and a half, this team is absolutely cooking. And it's really just been since this trade and this transformation. So incredible stuff here for the Mavericks. We are damn near locked in now to a Dallas Clippers rematch. That would be juicy, to put it lightly. But for now, let's focus on this game here against the Hornets. Dallas goes to Charlotte. And, you know, that means a, a rematch with our old friend Grant Williams. Interesting kind of thing there. Obviously, the, the Hornets, not, not as great, essentially. But Dallas still has to handle its business. It does have a top five record in the NBA in terms of road performance. I think with this win, they're now 24 and 15 I believe so Dallas coming in some interesting storylines rolling in. You got Luca 29 points away from the all time single season scoring record for Dallas and uh spoiler alert. He gets you that he ends up with 39 for the game, but he's basically got 27 at half. So it's essentially already locked in and then he buckets a three because of course it's a step back three that gets him the record in the third quarter. Dallas basically blew the doors off this game early and the Clippers hung around, made it kind of interesting at the end of the third quarter and rolling into the early minutes of the fourth quarter. But Dallas begrudgingly has to roll Luca back in in the fourth quarter. But what I liked is that he wasn't like beating himself up. He wasn't like going out. I would have rather him been able to rest the entire fourth quarter. Of course, I would have rather had that. But with how the third quarter ended and having that big, like 20 plus point lead whittled down to 14, it ends up getting as low as 11, I believe. Um, as you got guys like Davis Bertans coming in off the bench, dropping like 13 points or whatever. Is that how many he had? 13? Yeah, 13 points for Bertans and uh, Grant Williams. You know, he gets them 12 points as well. You just had a lot of guys just kind of hanging around enough. I think Dallas got a little complacent. But you have to roll Luca back in. At least he's rolling back in more as the floor general. He's not as focused and like gunning for buckets at this point. And Dallas just completely pulls away at the end. This went from an 11 point game to an, an absolute blowout here as it turns back into 26. So great stuff here. Really, the only reason I actually was debating what player I was going to have with the low corner here, I wanted to put um, Daniel Gafford because Gafford was a beast again 12 of 12 from the field here for Gafford in this game in 26 sorry 25 minutes he has 26 points and seven boards also gets you a couple of blocks the way this dude has transformed this role in Dallas um this is the center position in general I mean you obviously give credit to Derek Lively too I know he's out right now but the transformation of the center position in Dallas in the span of one year has been tremendous. And I didn't give enough credit to the Daniel Gafford trade when it happened. I was like, okay, yeah, that that's a good pickup, a good backup center. I like it. Hopefully he'll be like a, you know, a Brendan Haywood type. Ooh, I was disrespecting the hell out of that man without realizing it. Uh, Gafford has been incredible for Dallas. There have been games where his, his effectiveness has been neutralized a little bit, just depending on the other team's, style of pace and uh, play. But in games like this, he is just unstoppable. He's a wrecking machine. He had like 10 dunks in this game. And then even when he's not able to get a dunk, he's finishing tough, tough baskets around the rim through contact, like really, really good stuff. But alas, with Luca setting that record, that single season scoring record, I was like, it's gotta be Luca. So my, my compromise, you can't see it in the, in the photo, 
my compromise was here's Luca throwing a nifty behind the back pass to Gafford under the basket, leading to one of those dunks. That that was my compromise there. But yeah, man, it's uh it's really cooking for Dallas here. Again, 15 of their last 17 now that they win this game. Never really in doubt. Yeah, you get whittled down to 11 points, but you get whittled down without Luca being in the game. And so you know, like, okay, push comes to shove. Luca's going to come back in the game. Things are going to settle down, and they're going to pull away. And that's and that's exactly what happened. So Luca absolutely cooking in this game. Hits eight threes, eight of 17 from three. So absolutely feeling it. How many points did he have in the first quarter? I know he had 27 at the half. I feel like in the first quarter alone, he was just absolutely sizzling. And I didn't keep track of how many specific points he had in that frame. But he gets you a triple-double, 39, 12, and 10 on 13 of 29 from the field. 5 of 7 at the stripe. Even gets you a block, uh, which is nice. Speaking of nice blocks that you don't necessarily anticipate, Kyrie Irving gets you three blocks. What reality am I living in that Kyrie Irving is going to get you three blocks? Uh, Kyrie, another great game as well from him. Also a near triple-double, 18, 8, and 9. Now, his shot is a little bit off in this game. He's 6 of 15 from the field, including 2 of 8 from 3. So not dialed in there. But you know what? The man just dropped 48 points the game before in a much bigger stage. Uh, so I'm going to give him a little bit of benefit of the doubt here. A triple-double a triple double on not-so-efficient shooting. We'll make up for that, especially when it's a game like this that it's not needed. But Kai, three blocks, two steals, only two turnovers despite uh, handling the ball as much as he did. He was a plus 24. Luca, uh, a plus 22 as well. PJ Washington, ooh, man, he had a rough, uh, rough reunion game here. This was not a good game for him. PJ Washington. 0 of 6 from 3, 0 of 7 from the field, only 1 point, 7 boards, 3 assists. And the misses were all pretty glaring. Like, obviously, you go over and you're thinking, like, man, you just weren't feeling it. But sometimes there's a game where, ah, you're just a, you're just a hair off, but your muscle memory is so dialed in, you just can't quite find that rhythm and adjust accordingly. This wasn't that. This was just, like, everything looked off like I don't know if it was a mental thing if it was just like a little bit of physical uh like worn down or the emotion whatever playing against your old team not the kind of homecoming reunion you would want going against your old squad like that in your old building but you know it's all right because he's he's gonna get his first playoff experience of his career um and I'm sure that means more to him than, yeah, you would have liked to have seen him have 15 or 20 points or something like that. But it just wasn't going to happen in this game. That's one of the few kind of like, ah, that's a bummer notes I took from this game, which is like, man, for him, I kind of wished he had had a better performance. But it's all right. In the grand scheme of things, it doesn't really matter. It's really only that first game against your old team that really gets you hyped up. So by the time it rolls around again, maybe he's got a slight, slightly bigger chip on his shoulder to like do it better this go around, but it, it, it doesn't matter. So um, Tim Hardaway Jr. Had a solid game off the bench as well. I do want to give him credit whenever it is a good performance from him. Cause that's only fair. I feel 23 minutes. He had 15 points on six of 10 from the field, including a sick, nasty crossover uh, that dropped a man on the baseline for him to pull up for a mid ranger. Gets a, a friendly shooter bounce on it, but still, you, you drop a man, make him touch earth, not even touch earth, make the man just wipe the hell out, and then you splash a jumper or at least get the roll on a jumper. Uh, that's that's part and parcel. That's just getting everything for it. So liked, liked that little moment for him as well, but shout out to him on his performance. You also had uh, Dante Exum, very ho-hum game here, 20 minutes, two points, four boards, three assists. Only one of five from the field, 0 of three from three. So not a strong showing from Exum, but, you know, if Washington and Exum, two of your very, very important um, pieces of this team aren't really firing on all cylinders, but you got Luca, Kyrie, and Gafford all just cooking, and you're actually getting a pretty good performance out of, like, Hardaway off the bench, then cool. that That's good. I also liked getting 13 minutes for Jaden Hardy, even though... He only took one shot in this game, which is wild to me because usually this guy comes in, this kid, and he is just go, go, go. Get the shot, find the shot, bucket, bucket. 
he's going to look for his shot. He's aggressive, hyper aggressive looking for his shot usually. So for him to play 13 minutes and only attempt one shot made it. But that was that was interesting. I don't I did like some of the facilitating he did. He had uh, a couple assists, including a nice oop there uh, to Gafford, I believe it was. Um, he had a nice oop in the game and let's see a couple boards as well. Yeah, not, nothing really to, to speak to there. Other than that, you just kind of had everybody getting a little bit of time. It seemed like you got Omax getting some minutes, Lawson getting some minutes. Um, basically anybody, anybody of real rotational significance here. So I like this showing from Dallas. I like the fact that even though they kind of played with their food and looked like they might, I didn't, I didn't ever fear that this game was going to get away from them, but I did think like, I don't like that you're messing around enough that you're now going to have to bring Luca back in because you want to rest him the entire fourth quarter. We're locked into this situation now where as you're sitting here saying like, Hey, we're dialed in now to the playoffs. We're at least a top six seed. There's no, there's no reason to be pedal to the metal with Luca. You want to find him rest where you can. I didn't like having to put him back in, but at least it was like very much casual when he went in, just kind of doing his thing with his vision, his passing, just picking teams apart, uh, picking defenses apart, not having to really worry so much about like creating and doing all this elaborate stuff with the physicality and the wear and tear that you would worry about something significant. Um, Dallas shot 54% from the field. 34% from three, only 17 of 50. That's a lot of three-point shots. Again, in a game like this, it didn't really matter. Luca was cooking from that range, but really no one else was hitting significantly from three. The free throw percentage dropped off considerably. They go 13 of 20 at the line. That's only 65%. So as we talked about a couple games ago against Houston, the 40 of 45, I think it was, we're, we're like, all right, well, that's a phenomenal performance there. Not just getting to the line, but then converting it much more mixed bag here, like literally less than half of those attempts and still making it a much lower rate. So didn't matter in a game like this, not going to sweat it too much, but I like when you're aggressive and you're getting to the basket and you're getting to the free throw line, as opposed to shooting 53 shooting a lot of threes is okay. As long as it's not something that you're overly reliant on, because if it's not dropping, it will become a problem. So game like this doesn't matter. I feel like that's really the theme of everything I'm saying here, but it's something I guess to kind of keep an eye on. Um, you know, if you go into a rut, sometimes you, you press in the area where you're missing. So if you're missing threes, you're pressing and you're trying to force that issue when it's like, no, what you need to do is alter tactics, get to the, get to the basket, try to get to the line and then convert it there. Like take the moment to collect yourself, convert it there and then let that feed into opening up uh, your shooters a little bit more around the perimeter. So let's see anything else. Uh, Dallas killing it on the board again. That was the next stat I wanted to get to. 55 boards for Dallas. They are, they are really a good rebounding team finally, which is another one of those just like huzzah kind of developments because we suffered for so long where like Luca had to be the leading rebounder. Um, night in, night out without fail. And other than him, it was not a lot going on. So getting 55 boards, including 16 offensive, compare that to 39 for the Hornets and eight on the offensive glass. Also love the defensive performance. We got seven blocks. Again, Kyrie leading the team with three and uh, six steals as well. I really like that. So a lot of great stuff from Dallas here. I'm trying to see if there's anything else specific I want to call out in this game. Uh, not significantly, not significantly. So, so let's look at the broader conversation here around this team. As we assess where we're at right now with a couple games left, Dallas has, as I said earlier, this is from Grant Afseth on Twitter has the fifth best road winning percentage in the NBA this year at 61 and a half percent. That is really good, especially when you're a team that will not have home court advantage in any round of, well, if you got to the finals, I guess it would come down to a record, but any record in the, uh, any matchup in the West, you're not going to have home court advantage. 
You can steal home court advantage. That's a different conversation, but I'm just talking about the overall advantage going in. So having a good top five road record is significant. That is something to keep an eye on. As it relates to this next game for Dallas, we got a matchup against Miami. Why that's significant in Dallas's favor is because even though you're in Miami, the Heat did just have to play, and the Mavericks are too. They're both on the second night of a back-to-back. But Miami just had to play a double overtime game last night. And as all things Mav points out, this, this was the added context that made that even more tantalizing to me. Jimmy Butler, Tyler Hero, and Bam all played over 44 minutes. That's significant. Now, again, Dallas has not clinched the five seed yet, so they do still have some business to handle. But at the very least, having that opportunity, even if it's a road game, an opportunity to make another statement, which we talked about after the trade, one of their first really big statements was against Miami in a gritty win in the double AC. Uh, being able to now go to the AAA American Airlines Arena, I believe it's still called that for Miami, being able to go there and handle your business uh, is significant. And you're getting a chance where, at least on paper, it looks like you have a real opportunity here. So something to keep an eye on. They're going to play tonight at Miami. And uh, let me see. I'm just looking at the injury report here. Obviously, Lively out. Brown and Josh Green are out for Miami. You have doubtful is Terry Roger. Duncan Robinson is out and Richardson as well. So yeah, interesting, interesting matchup here. A couple other interesting things of note, just random nuggets of information here. NBA history says Luka Doncic and Shea Gilgis out Gilgis out Shea Gilgis Alexander, I got tongue tied on a, a name I say all the time talking about NBA, are the third pair of players in NBA history to each score 50, or each record 50 plus games of 30 plus points in the same season. So I'll say that again. The third pair of players in NBA history to each record 50 or more games of 30 plus points in the same season to give context to that that is joining elgin baylor and wilt chamberlain from the 62 63 season and let's see walt bellamy and wilt chamberlain from the 61 62 season so yeah real real elite company there shout out for not just luca and the mavericks but also give a little love to okc because hey good for them and in that trade-off there, they do have themselves a superstar and a real centerpiece to, to continue building around with their just embarrassment of draft picks in terms of riches. Uh, let's see here. Mark, Mark Aguirre, we'll talk about that. Again, this is Luca on breaking that Mark Aguirre record for the Mavs single season scoring record. Says, it means a lot. It's the franchise that drafted me. They gave me, they say, the keys. They say it like that, but I'm just glad I'm here in Dallas. Nice, nice. I, I like the I like the perspective there, and that it means more to him to be able to set records for for the team that drafted him, and not just looking at like, oh, well, if I end up moving here at some point, or I move on to another team and I do it somewhere else, whatever. It means more to him doing it for the place that initially basically gave him that. I say gave him that opportunity, but that that brought him in the team that wanted him and moved you know, a lot of things around to make sure they still got him even after the initial lottery luck wasn't so good for them. Uh, Landon Thomas points out the Mavericks will clinch a top five seed in the West and win the Southwest division title with one more win or one Pelicans loss in the remaining three games of the regular season. The Mavericks still have the heat, the Pistons and the thunder. The Pelicans have the Kings warriors and Lakers. Lakers are still fighting for a lot. Warriors are still fighting for a lot. Kings are kind of, you know, they're still fighting, but they're they're not as dire straits as the Warriors and Lakers. So that's a lot of that's a lot to take on for the Pelicans, I think. Um, something to do there. The Mavericks, again, they, they gotta win one more or have the Pelicans lose uh one of these. So I think they're pretty much secured. And the Heat, 
they don't have anything that they're really playing for. The Pistons, they could always surprise you and bite your ankles or something like that, but you should be able to handle your business there. And the Thunder have dropped out enough from, you know, for a long time, they were at that one seed in the West. They've dropped back now where they're not in that position. And so at this point, and I guess let me take a peek at the standings because they might still be in a, a pretty contended, pretty heated battle for the two seed. I'm trying to think if the Thunder have a whole lot of incentive to really fight for this game. So the Thunder are currently the three seed. The T-Wolves are the one. The Nuggets are the two. The Thunder are a game back of the Nuggets. So that is worth noting. But they're three games up on the Clippers. So they don't have a lot to worry about losing. But they could still fight to get the two seed from the Nuggets if they can rest that away. So that being our last regular season game of the year, it's a chance that one is a little bit more hotly contended. And usually I say these games, not always again, a a good show of like leadership and championship pedigree is the team that even if they're not the more desperate team coming in, still finds a way to get the job done. Sometimes it doesn't matter if you're the better team. It matters if you're the more desperate team, the more complacent team will lose even to a worse opponent. And we kind of have seen that at times, um, you know, when, especially when it's an even footing, it, it's all the more reason, uh, reason to believe that when we lost our rolling win streak against the Warriors in that first matchup recently, they were the more desperate team. They had so much more that they were fighting for, whereas Dallas had kind of already secured its place, at least in that play in picture. And so it wasn't as desperate for them. They had just moved up at the time to five and the Warriors were still fighting for their lives. Trips up Dallas. Dallas has to then come back and try to rebound in the subsequent games. They do, but that first go around, the more desperate team won. That's why I said beating Houston recently and in, in the second time you beat them um, in the span of about a week, when you ended their season, that was a huge moment to me because not only are they a team that had been, they, they are certainly talented and on the upswing. Like they, they look like they could be a real problem here soon but they were fighting for everything. Their season was on the line and Dallas didn't have a whole lot other than like basically pride in just trying to make a statement to fight for. I said at the time that would be so easy of a game to let slip or to mess around with, not take seriously enough. Then you just kind of take, take it on the chin and just move on. Like, all right, whatever we'll reset next game. They didn't even worry about that or let that be a risk. Instead, they came back and, handled their business in that second half. This is sort of what we're looking at here, where by the time we get to that final game against the Thunder, the Thunder might still have incentive to fight and try to win that game. Whereas Dallas, they'll have clinched the, in all likelihood, they'll have clinched the five seed not likely that they'll be able to move up. There's still two back of the Clippers with three to play. So not likely that they're going to move up. They'll probably be locked into the five, but the Thunder might still have something to fight for. And the Thunder are, I would say, a same same tier of team in terms of talent and ability as the Mavericks. Now, pound for pound, both at full health, I think I would lean Dallas in a playoff series over the Thunder but that's a hypothetical that's not even worth worrying about right now because it would be a subsequent round. You worry about what's in front of you. So in that kind of picture, we'll see what happens in that last game. Uh, Anything else? Oh man, shout out by the way, and I say this with all the sarcasm in the world, shout out to the Phoenix Suns who played the Clippers without Kawhi and without Harden and just est the bed. Like, remarkably so, what basically allowed Dallas to clinch that spot of being a top six seed was Phoenix just having an utter meltdown. And what was it? In the first quarter, that first 12 minutes, you had like Durant, Booker, and Beal combining for 0 of 12 from the field with no Kawhi and no James Harden. That's uh, that's impressive. I'm, I'm really kind of amazed at the ability to have a big moment where you need that win, you have favorable, favorable circumstances 
and you come out and just can't do anything. Really, uh, really remarkable there to me that Phoenix drops that game. Um, yeah, they lose at home 105-92 in that game. Let me, I want to take a peek here and remind myself of these stats. Uh, for the Clippers, Russell Westbrook had a triple-double. Shout out to him. I, I don't care about the criticism Russ gets. I'm still a Russ dude. 16, 15, and 15 for Russ. Paul George, 23, 7, and 5. And let's see for the Suns here. Durant had 21 points, 8 of 22 from the field, so not great. Booker, only 12 points. Holy hell, 1 of 11 from the field. 1 of 11 from the field. 10 of his 12 points were at the free throw line. Don't ever talk to me about Devin Booker being in the same class as Luka Doncic. If you weren't convinced by his Luka special garbage and then how he responded versus how Luka responded in the in the Western Conference semifinals a couple of years ago, never the the flack and just downright disrespect Luka would catch, the hell he would catch for a big stage, big opportunity moment like this to just crap the bed it, it, he would never live it down guys like tatum and booker can have these performances and it's like it doesn't matter meanwhile luca can drop a game like this where the team might lose he'll go for 46 46 13 and 10 and you'll still have people in the national media saying like oh he's just he's a high usage player and he just can't get his teammates involved and his defense is subpar like the criticisms there's always so many more shades of bullshit when it comes to why we want to pick apart Luca uh, and why he is or is not something. You don't have these criticisms at all for Tatum or for Booker. And both of those guys have been called like, oh, the next Kobe Bryant. Oh, Tatum was you know mentored by Kobe. And people were calling Devin Booker the next Kobe when he was like a second year player because he dropped 70 points in a game. Woohoo! Great job. But the difference is Kobe, Kobe was a killer on both sides, and Kobe didn't have a lot of games that were like this. It's it's just a different thing, man. It's wild to me the the way that we try to elevate certain guys and then act like they're immune from majority of criticism, or at least have a short-term memory of that criticism. Whereas guys like Luca, it's just like everything is Teflon. Everything's gonna Teflon. That's everything six two, right? Whatever. Uh, never, never seems to be able to shed it no matter what they do. It's like a cognitive bias. In other Mavericks news, with the uh, most recent developments here, the Mavericks are finally giving up the final pick in the trade in the trade for uh, Kristaps Porzingis. And uh, the fact that it's occurring in what is most recently being called the worst draft projection for the last 10 years. It's pretty remarkable. So the initial KP trade in 2019 involved a future first round pick. Uh, and it will now finally, those final conditions will be met on this trade. So the KP chapter, the KP Knicks chapter, I want to be clear, not the subsequent trade a couple of years after that. Uh, the initial KP trade, the business will finally be handled. And the fact that the Mavericks are giving a first round pick to the Knicks during what will be what is at least projected to be one of the worst draft classes in about a decade is a uh, very fortunate for the Mavericks. If you're not going to have a first round pick, that would be the year you would want to not have a first round pick. So you'll love to see it, especially with the Knicks being relevant and good. Now you, you didn't want to like give them a first, an extra first round pick, like right at that moment when they're already on an upswing. Cause then it just feels like you're giving them an even bigger assist. Um, anything else, anything else, anything else? No, I believe that does it for what I've got here. So that is a long rambling thing. It started out as a post game show, kind of broke out into a, a little bit of just a, a chat here, an extended chat, mini pod, if you will. So, what did you think of the Mavericks' performance in Charlotte? How do you feel about the all an all likelihood rematch with the Clippers? Mavs Clippers three, the reckoning, as I like to think of it. Let me know in the comments. Subscribe to the Dallas Prospect, like the video, and until next time, guys. Remember, every legend was once a prospect. Peace.